Hey there, and welcome back to another Collector Conversation with a very special guest, Dana Lee. Thank you for coming by, Dana. Thanks for having me. Dana, for those of you who don't know, she's behind Tell the Time Watches. And um, tell the people a little bit about what you do and what you write about. Yeah, so generally for Tell the Time, it is an online resource that's dedicated to covering things within the watch industry and the watch community um, from the women's perspective and for women primarily. Um, I started this about a year ago, which is kind of crazy to see how it's grown since then. Right. But um, obviously, I'm a collector and enthusiast first and foremost. And I just felt like at the time, there weren't as many resources out there that were available for women who were interested in watches. And I didn't feel like there was a lot out there that spoke to how I thought about watches and, and just pieces in general as a collector. So, you know, I obviously love watches. Yep. That's why we're here today. And wanted to, you know, start that really as a creative outlet. But it's just blossomed since then. And so, you know, I hope for anyone who comes to the site, um, the account, the platform, whatever that, whatever they're looking to gain from it, I just hope that they get to learn something, whether they're just starting out or they're, you know, super deep into their collection and they already know um, anything and everything about watches. Yeah, I think it's important to have, you know, the more perspectives, the better. And I, sure. we met... Um, it feels like yesterday, but I guess it's like a few, maybe six, seven months ago yeah. now, right? And the first thing I noticed when I met about you, just such an interesting perspective, right? Because, you know, you love watches, and yes, you you, you write, you know, with the end, the intent to speak to um, a, a female audience, and people sometimes have in their head of, like, you know, what does a female collector want? And diamonds, and, you know, it needs to be very dainty or feminine, and but no, a female collector is just a female collector. Yeah. They just love watches yeah. all the same, maybe... You can't wear a 50 millimeter or something like that. Yeah. But that's really the only um, parameter, right? Beyond that, um, a female collector loves everything just the same as a male collector. And the way yeah. that you, you look at watches and talk about watches, I really love that as well. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. And I mean, you know, to your point too, there's, you know, when I, when I first kind of started collecting, like there was a lot of talk about like a women's watch or like a watch made for women. And for me, it was kind of like, and for me as well as a lot of female collectors, I would say, you know, we're kind of like, well, what is like a woman's watch? It's really just a watch that's worn by a woman. There's no kind of, it's not necessarily a particular box or, you know, some sort of one single definition of what we love. And so, you know, I, I, I try to promote that as much as possible as well as all the amazing women in the industry. And it's, it's like what what I what I write about on Tell the Time, it's nothing necessarily I would say is like new, right? Like women collectors have been in this community, in this industry forever, right? Like yes. they're not just suddenly coming up. Now, granted, with more perspectives coming into this industry, I think it's kind of encouraging more women who are, you know, new to watches or were not sure kind of how to enter the space. They're feeling more comfortable to do that. But all of these things, they're not they're not new ideas. They're, no. they've, they, they've been there, right? And so for me, it's just important to be able to to showcase that and give you know women in this in the space the voice to to share their stories because they're they're super unique and have um, sometimes really amazing stories and perspectives to share. Oh, yeah, that's true, amazing stories. And uh, let's let's start out with a wrist check. I'll go okay. first, and then actually, no, ladies first. What what do you okay. have? Uh, what's on the wrist today? So I have a vintage watch. It is a Rolex Root Beer GMT from the nice. 1970s. It is the matte dial version um, with the nipple dial. Um, this was my first kind of you know big girl purchase. Yeah. Um, I had been working for a couple of years when I when I got this watch and you know had some money saved up, was doing well, and so I wanted to reward myself. And I always knew that kind of my first you know I success marker, purchase, whatever you want to call it, was going to be a watch because I'd always just really loved watches. And so I, you know, started my hunt. Um, and I actually didn't find the watch for about a year, year and a half. Um, but I walked into a shop. They, they had this in the window. I was very surprised. Um, and I saw it and I just immediately knew that yeah, just, that had to, yeah, it, that was like, I knew, you. yeah, I was like, I knew this was, this was, this was the one. And um, for me, now this watch reminds me and when I when I need a little bit of a confidence boost on some days or just, you know, when I need a little bit of that, you know, that, pop. That was, <laughs> um, that was a mountain you climbed. Exactly. You know? It's a nice reminder of like, all right, you know, the first kind of big professional milestone I had is tied to this. And so every time that I 
you know, have something big or even just on a day where I, I want to, um, you know, kind of feel that that way. Again, yeah. I just, I kind of pop it on and it, you know, the colors on it work super well. Yes. It's a very neutral color palette. So I just, I can throw it on with just about anything. Um, so let's talk a little bit of what started your journey. What, what was the first watch that, that gave you the watch bug? Yeah, I mean... If you can remember. I've, I, I think I've always kind of just had a fascination towards watches. Um, you know, there... I, for, I would say, most of my life. Granted, you know, there were periods of my life where I didn't necessarily wear a watch, but I always was interested in them mm -hmm. because, to me, um, one, I, before I knew really specifics about watches, it was always just amazing to me to see how, like, something like this could be ticking with, like, no electricity. Yeah. I mean, like, talking as simply as that, right? Like, even when I was a kid, I was like, wow, like, you know, how does this work? And so um, always kind of had that curiosity. And then you see some of these, you know, gorgeous, I mean, really art pieces, yeah. um, for a lack of better words. And that just kind of always piqued my interest. But um, I first got used to wearing a watch, I'll say. And this kind of um, goes with one of the watches I brought. Um, I had a flick flack when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it is the one on the table right there that's that looks a little... You know, out there. Yeah. Oh, I love <laughs> Looks it. a little out there. Um, but this was a Flick Flack. Um, I believe it was made in 1997. Um, it is a dive watch, which I found very interesting. Oh, it is a yes. dive watch. So if you turn the bezel, oh. it works. Yeah, exactly. So it's, a, it's, like, so a, it's cool. like a children's dive watch, um, which is fun. I was obviously not using the bezel other than just turning it for fun. But um, my parents gave me that when I was probably about oh, three or four, um, just really for me to have a watch and just have something. And I wore it for as long as I could remember when I was a kid. I probably stopped wearing it when I was about like eight or nine. Um, and I couldn't really find the one I had as a kid. Oh, I'm sure. So yeah, and and even if I did, I don't know if yeah, it would be. Yeah, it was like you know I, I wore I that thing to the beach. Be, you know, yeah, <laughs> I wore it to the beach. I wore it, you know, like running around in the park. So it's probably not in the best condition. But I did find one that was the exact same uh, reference and model. So I obviously had to pick it up because nostalgia. Yeah, you know, and it's just a cool, fun watch. Of course, you know, it, it's for a child, but like it's a nice, nice little diarist piece. The colors are nice, and like I just love because we're in this day and age where. You know, some kids aren't even taught how to tell time, right? Mm -hmm. And like, look at a nice watch where you could teach your, your child how to tell time and also teach them how to use a diver's bezel, use it as a way to elapse time, right? And just mm -hmm. teaching their brain how to work in a different way, right? And I think that's just so cool because, you know, as, you know, we get older and certain technologies kind of go away and certain things like even like uh, writing in cursive and stuff. Like simple things like this is like, you know, when I have a child, it's like, for sure I'm getting them like, now I definitely want to them to have like a flick flag or something cool with like a diver's bezel because yeah. like you know I'm a beach boy and it's like, I'd love to show them how to use a glass yeah. timer and stuff like that. Yeah now that you mention it actually I think that watch was how I learned to tell time yeah. like on, on a on a I guess now we make the distinction of like an analog versus yeah, a exactly, digital right? watch. Before we were but, <laughs> yeah but that I think that was you know my, my parents wanted me to be able to kind of like have something where I could learn and obviously you know to a three four year old it's kind of hard to figure that out oh, yeah. so you know having that right there on my wrist and you know I just kind of wore it around because it was fun I liked it you know when you're a kid and you find something that like turns and clicks you're like wow this yeah, is so yeah, fun. fun um I actually still wear that watch on occasion yeah, now I would. I would. yeah so what's the next on the line of what was next for you in, in, in what so, you have here yeah, um, thinking kind of chronologically here, I would say probably the next one and probably the most special one I have. So after I had that flick flack, you know, there was a period of time where I wasn't really wearing watches. And in high school, you know, when you're taking your standardized tests, I think that was kind of like another revival of like getting used to wearing a watch yeah. again, right? So I remember taking standardized tests and they're like, you know, no phones. So started wearing a watch. I don't have that one, but it was, you know, just like a G-Shock that I took from my dad mm -hmm. um, because he had it and G-Shocks are wonderful. So yes. I wish I still had it, <laughs> but I don't. Um, and after that, this was my first, this was the first piece I had, um, I got this as a gift from my mom, actually, and this watch belonged to my grandpa. Oh, wow. 
So this is really, I would say, what set off the, you know, insane rabbit hole yeah. I've like <laughs> kind of delved down and now have somehow made like a living and a career out of That's it. Really how that works, yeah, eh? yeah, no, for sure. So this is the watch that I like to say really truly started it all. So I got this um, a number of years ago now, but this watch is just really special to me because I didn't get to meet my grandpa. He passed three years before I was born, and so I didn't know this was in the family at all. And my mom was thinking about, you know, you're graduating college, like, do you want a gift? And I was like, no, totally fine. Come to New York, we'll just, you know, we'll have a good time, we'll celebrate. And she, then I think about a month after I graduated, she had told me, she's like, I remember I do have something actually. Oh, wow. And so she sends me a photo with like zero context. Um, it, it wasn't with the strap or anything, but I was like, where, did you buy this? Like what was going on? And so she told me the story about how it belonged to my grandpa. Um, he bought it, I can't remember when, but this watch is from 1969 um, and he wore it pretty much his entire life. Watch so his daily. Yeah, he wore it um, really everywhere through anything. And my understanding, based on what my mom told me, because I didn't get to meet him, he worked um, as one of like the first mates, or I'm not really sure like what <laughs> what the <laughs> rankings are, but someone who like worked on ships that were traveling um, from Hong Kong to really everywhere. I guess the first mate makes sense, yeah. Yeah, so not the captain, but the captain's right-hand man, I yeah. guess. <laughs> um, so that's what he did for a living, and so he was traveling like all the time to pretty much everywhere. And so he bought this watch for himself, and you know, I, I see old pictures of my grandpa, and he's a very kind of, polished, like, you know, just very elegant man, yeah. for lack of a better word. Like, I don't know anywhere, anything like else I can, any other word I can use to describe it. I mean, he was just so well put together all the time. And so seeing this watch, I was like, this makes sense. Yes. You know, and because I didn't get to meet him, it's nice that I have this now. And I, I wear it quite frequently because it reminds me of him. And so I feel like I have a connection to him, even though I didn't get to meet him. And it's just, really special to, to be able to, you know, have that, I think, it's like a piece of my family's history and, and you know, that, that connection to someone who meant a lot to my mom and, yeah. um, you know, to me as well. And, and uh, that's amazing to be able to have that with you, like, all the time, you know, a piece of him and a piece of your family, especially you didn't get to meet him. And, the, you know, the, the watch itself is a gorgeous watch, right? Yes. Like the, the dial on its Oyster Perpetual is... Um, amazing. I've never seen a dial particularly like, um, I don't even know how to describe it. It kind of has like yeah. that, um, it's, it's slay, but it kind of has a, a very nice texture. So fun on fact it. on that dial too, actually, it used to be blue. Really? I know. It's, it, yeah. So it oh. used to be blue. Um, if you look around the crown, there's like these little yes, flecks yes, I can of see. blue. So it's a mosaic dial. And um, if you Google like one of the blue mosaic dials, you'll kind of see it's like a very vivid blue, but just over time with the wear and probably nice having tropical. it out in the sun. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful tropical. So it's definitely, you know, enjoyed its travels. I love that. Exactly. It's It's been well loved and is, I would hope, continuing to be well loved. Yeah. <laughs> you see that's what happens, you know, when you wear your watches, they kind of they kind of love you back and right. they uh they kind of do some things and they they become very very individual. Right. When you uh when you actually use them and you don't just keep them, you know, locked up in your yeah. safe, but you actually like put your memories on them, put a little bit of sweat on them, sweat out a few straps and stretch out the bracelet and all that and then you get a watch that you would never sell this watch. But you could never put a value on how beautiful this dial is right now. Like Rolex wish they could make a dial that looks like that today. Look yeah. at that. That's amazing. Yeah, and I mean, you know, this one of the reasons why I love, and you can kind of see I have a lot of vintage pieces here, but one of the reasons why I love it so much is because watches to me, they're they're inherently a very timeless object, yes. right? Um, you know, you when you when you buy a watch, you know that this isn't something that you're gonna like like a piece of clothing, for example, you might wear a year, maybe two, and then just kind of toss it, donate it, et cetera. Like this is something that, you know, you'll have for quite a number of years. And especially with vintage watches, I mean, you know, that's transcended 
two generations yeah. right now. Like I'm the third generation to have had it. So I, I just personally really love that. And not only wearing the watches, you know, kind of gives it that unique character, but it's like you're kind of adding to its story and like continuing a new chapter. So I, it's it's very like it's a very like emotional and poetic yeah. aspect to it. But that's like one of my favorite things about watches. And I do enjoy that about vintage as well is that you could pick up a piece from the 60s and 50s, you can wind it right. I don't, I'm telling you, I'm looking at that dial right now and like there are other really good, beautiful dials. But to know that mm. that started out blue and it's here with me today and it looks aqua green, all kind of crazy yeah. colors with a beautiful texture. You know, what? you just don't get that from other other um, items uh, very much. So. For sure. Um, uh, what's next? Tell me about this beautiful gold piece you have there. Oh, this one right here. Yeah. So this is a nice kind of continuation from the watch that I had previously. So this is actually my mom's watch. Oh, okay. So my mom's side of the family, as, I can, as you can tell, they, they weren't necessarily like watch collectors, mm -hmm. but I think they had an appreciation for a watch. And so this was my mom's was, because I now have yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, this was for a period of time, her kind of daily wear watch as well, um, similar to how um, the OP was my grandpa's daily wear. So this is actually one of the original Chanel premieres. Um, oh, wow. So I know Chanel earlier this year re-released it, yes. um, but I had found this in the family safe. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I was, I was running some errands for my mom and I had seen it and I took it, then yeah, asked her if I exactly. could take it, right? After it was in your possession. Exactly, <laughs> forgiveness, you know, yeah, better yeah. to ask for forgiveness than permission. Um, but, you know, I mean, she hadn't worn it in over 20 years. Oh, so, so then, you know, it I think some it was, love, you know? It, I think it was, you know, up for grabs, like at that, at that point. <laughs> <laughs> at least that's what I told myself. But, um, so I had brought this in um, to have, you know, Chanel kind of clean it up and, yeah. and get the bat get a new battering in so it would be working. And I had asked because I was curious, I was like, oh, do you know like when this was from? Because my mom didn't really remember. And they said, oh, it's actually from like 87 based on the serial oh, number, wow. which was the first year it was released. Um, so I, I mean, you know, obviously an emotional connection to my mom. This is also very much my mom. Um, her style and, and everything just goes with this. She actually had it sized, so this watch wears slightly loose. And same for me, it wears slightly loose, so it wears like a bracelet for me. Yeah. But I almost love that. Exactly. It's not fitted properly, but with the way this watch is designed, it's it almost to, just feels like... Like a, like a nice bracelet, like a nice jewelry. Yeah, it feels good. But it also, because of this, you know, the black and gold contrast here and the leather with the metal, it just, it just feels really like easy and cool. Like it's yeah. like an effortlessly kind of cool look. At least that's how I feel when I put it on. And like it, it's so, watches from the 80s and 90s, man, they were just, they're just doing crazy things. You know what I mean? Look at this leather woven into gold. And there are other brands who've done leather with gold, but not in this way. Yeah. You know where like, you know, it's part of the bracelet in the same sense, a beautiful faceted crystal up top and it's just clean, it's elegant, but like audacious, right? Yeah. You know, for Chanel, it's a very audacious watch. Yeah, and I mean, that, that pretty much describes my mom. And I honestly think Chanel overall, their watchmaking is fairly underrated in my opinion. Yes. Um, I mean, they've made some very serious watches even with the latest release, but you know, their J12, they made a ceramic watch before ceramic became cool. Yes, and, always and a good mainstream. seller. By yeah. the way, the J12 is like, you know, on the pre-owned side, we don't really buy much Chanel. J12 will always trade in a J12 because they always sell. Because it's right. a, a well-done watch. And like you said, right. they were kind of in ceramic before ceramic became super cool. Yeah. And then, again, they they targeted the couple's watch really well. And where, like, um, ladies love J12. Men actually love J12, right. too. And, like, the J12 Chrono did very well. And just a nice, fun ceramic. The black ceramic looked good. And then they did, like... The, the only watch editions are like half black, half white. Mm -hmm. And they just, again, they're having, they're ha they have fun with the watches. And now they're serious watch making stuff. It's just like, oh right. wow. You like know? some of their skeleton watches are just, I mean, you wouldn't, you almost wouldn't expect that out of Chanel because when you think of Chanel, I think most people think like they're a fashion brand. Exactly. Like bags, you know, shoes, clothing, but they have a very serious, they have some very serious pieces. Yes. Yeah. Now, now let's let's talk about the biggest watch here, which would be this, this beautiful piece <laughs> in the center. I know we, I, I said the ladies don't like big watches, but this might prove me a little bit wrong. It's not huge, but it's a different shape. So tell us a little about this one. That one is funky, to yeah. say <laughs> the least. It's very funky. 
Um, so, I mean, when you look at this watch, it just screams 70s. Yes. Um, because it is from the 70s. <laughs> um, but it is a Pierre Cardin watch that was actually made by JLC. So it is, it was obviously designed to be a fashion watch. Pierre Cardin is a French fashion designer. And in the 70s, you know, they created this futuristic, you know, space age collection and watches were a part of that. So this was kind of the brainchild of that. There's a bunch of different variations from that collection. This just happens to be my favorite. So I didn't really see it often. Oh, and it's mechanical. Yes, and it's mechanical. Oh, the movement is like the size of oh. like a quarter, if that. If you look on the side, yeah, you can kind of oh, see. Oh, mm -hmm. maybe a dime, maybe a nickel. <laughs> yeah, um, but it's just fun. It's my fun watch for sure, but something about it also wears incredibly comfortable. I know it doesn't look comfortable, but when you put it on, I mean, it just wears comfortable. Well, well exactly, because the watch itself isn't like, the, how they built it is not the, the largest watch like mm -hmm. on the wrist and the strap is just like a big strap that's very very pliable oh yeah so i could see it being like very wearable honestly and very 70s very funky and yeah. the fact that there's a jlc inside makes it such a watch guy watch girls watch watch oh, person's yeah. watch right mm -hmm. and how about jlc just powering everything cool? you know? right i mean jlc is one of the I mean, they, they just have done so many great things for the watch industry, period, yes. right? So many movements, so many brands, designs, like almost wouldn't exist if it weren't for some of their contributions. Yes, yes. So I'm a big fan. And when I found out about this particular collaboration, I was like, this is really cool. I want one. <laughs> and it took me a while to track it down because I had seen it, you know, with when we t think about watches and, and this whole industry kind of going through a shift, right? Like I found that watch and I knew it existed because of social media. Yes. And so I had seen it, you know, on some collector's page, loved it. And I was like, I need to find this. And then last year through, you know, everything working out kind of like all the all the forces out there yeah. kind of aligning the just it just yeah it, it. it really i mean really truly i had seen it on there was this one dealer from france that i that followed and she's this really awesome vintage um dealer and i saw the watch and i was like that's really cool is this yours and she's like no it's for sale so i mean the rest is history from there yeah no it's uh, i love that you know sometimes it's meant to be i know fine Find them and like this and a Chanel are great examples of like you can find such cool and fun watches if you just look back a little bit. And it's hard to find like, you know, catalogs or advertisements of that time. But you know, thankfully we have Instagram now. And if you can, you know, find the right people to follow, you know, you'll see a picture and you just gotta you gotta hunt a little bit and it'll take a year or so to find it, but you'll get a piece that like nobody else will have. And you can wear this like in a room full of watch nerds. And like, hey, it's a JLC movement, you know, kind of talks much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so funny whenever I do wear that to an event or, or some sort of meetup because people are like, what, what is that? Yeah. Um, like, what is that on your wrist? And then, you know, once I explain, like, they're very intrigued because yeah. they're like, is this like, this is a watch clearly, but like, it's angular, it's got, and, and I, I just like love how playful the design is because, yes. you know, it goes outside of the traditional shape for a watch and, you know, it just feels funky. All right, so last but not least, let's talk about the, the most vivid dial here, um, which would be the, the newest pickup that you have. Tell yes. us about the Seiko. So this is one of the few modern watches <laughs> I have, um, and I just want to give a little bit of a shout out to Eric Wind and Jack Carlson um, for designing this beautiful piece and, and for, um, you know, making this happen. Yep. Um, this is the Seiko Rowing Blazers collab. Um, this is the third edition. Honestly, I'm one of my favorites because I'm very biased and I love purple. Yeah, it's great purple. And I mean, I've written a whole article on purple watches. So as you can see, like I really do love purple. Very but um, one of the reasons why I love the color so much is it's, it's very, not only is it vivid like you mentioned, but you can really take that shade and go in so many different directions. Yes. And sure, that's applicable for blue, it's applicable for red and a lot of the common colors out there. But I think this just has and I say regal because I know purple is associated with kind of like that, the, yeah. with be, but like royal, power. but it's it's a very nice power color, a yes. subtle power color. Exactly. Like it's less in your face than red, but, right? But, but you're there, you know? Right. You're there, but you're not, if that makes sense. Exactly. And 
I mean, it's just, it's just a beautiful color. But one of my favorite things about this watch is just kind of how the color combinations are designed, right? You have a little bit of that dark green for a contrast. You have the yellow, which kind of almost is, is um, you know, kind of brings out that contrast yes. with the purple dial. And so, I mean, it's just a really fun piece. It's so comfortable. This is a 40 millimeter, if you can believe it. Yeah. Um, but it wears like, I would say it probably wears like a 38. Yeah, um, sure. And it's super comfortable. Um, it's just, it's just fun, and I think, you know, especially when you think about like watch collaborations, there's a lot of really, you know, serious watch collaborations from brands like, you know, from Seiko all the way up to, you know, MDNF. And I think one of my favorite parts about watch collaborations in general is you can kind of see like a like a best of both worlds exactly. and really see what two brands, whether they're watch brands or you know, a watch brand and in this case, you know, a, a clothing brand and a fashion brand, you can really kind of see what they bring to the table. And it's it's really fun to to see what they come up with. It's so cool. It, it, it's a really nice purple. And the, I, I just like that they're having fun, you know? And you can see, like, this is very, um, you know, the community, the watch community is very just behind it, right? From the first the first Rowan Blazers um, edition, you can see everybody loved this. You just kept going with it. And it's just like a win-win because um, I think three colors were released or? Four, yeah. white was one of them. And then there's two other colors, pink and yellow for this specific edition. Yeah, yeah. and the, the, the purple is probably my favorite. They didn't see it in person. The pictures were great, but in person, it's just the pictures don't do it justice. Yeah, it's just a fun watch. Like yeah. even the purple on the green and yellow, like, like how could you not like this watch? You it's know? also great year round, I think, too, right? Like, yes. sure, the colors are a little bit muted if you want something brighter for summer, but I think you know overall it really works with just about you know kind of any season, which is really nice as well. Um, Obviously, as you can kind of see with my watches, I kind of take a little bit of it. Like the straps are my way of kind of adapting yeah, it to the season. As you should, as you should. Yeah, so I have a white strap on um, the OP right now because, you know, it's it's warmer yeah. outside. It's But like it's perfect, right? That, that, that OP, like when you brought it down the white strap and you know, oh, I'm, I'm going to change it back. I was like, oh, I love it on the white strap. Yeah. You know, I'm a big, I always talk about, you know, changing shots because we get so stuck on keeping the the OEM strap on there, let's keep the original strap on there. But it's like, why not? It's your watch, you paid for it. Right. You know what I mean? Like the brand isn't right. gonna spank you, or oh, why did you swap straps, you know? But one of my favorite things about seeing strap combinations that people come up with is you can kind of get a sense of the person's style. Yes. And like what what their, you know, what their personality is like and it really shines because some someone might take an already like bold watch with like some really bright colors and they'll just go even more bold, yep. right? And you're like, okay, cool. Like I see kind of where you're going at this. Or it's like, you know, they have classic combinations and it kind of makes sense because their wardrobe is classic. Exactly. Um, but it's also the quickest way to get a brand new watch. Right? <laughs> you know, a lot of times people are like, oh, I don't want to spend X. And it's like, you know, for between, uh, the time to watch between a buck 50 and 700 bucks, you can get a $100,000 watch, depending, right? Depending yeah. on what it is, depending on your price point. Or a new $5,000 watch, a new $2,000 watch. Just by changing the strap. And it mm -hmm. changes the whole, how you wear it, how you mm -hmm. feel about that, or your emotional the value of that watch all of a sudden changes because you're like, wow, you know, and I've seen it time and time again where you, you have one watch and you, you keep it a certain way and you just change the strap and the per person will just light up like they've never ever seen that watch before. And you can always, I mean, you can always keep the original strap, right? But I think, you know, from a brand's perspective, and this is just me speculating here, for, for a brand, you might want to create something that's more, you know, that's more universal for everyone, right? Yes. But if you do want to kind of take it up that next notch, it, it, you know, you will want to be able to customize your straps. And that's why brands will offer that service, yes. right? Like they wouldn't offer that if that wasn't something exactly. that people did. And so, you know, I, I, we, we talk about this a lot, but really, truly, I've definitely seen some watches where I'm, I'm okay with it when it, you know, it's coming out of the case and I'm trying yeah, it on. I'm like, oh, okay, it feels sometimes. But then I see it on someone else where they've changed the strap. Like, yeah. really, just that simple. And I'm like, okay, that's really Yeah, because, cool. you know, it made it very, like, individual to them. So it changes yeah. everything. Oh, man. Th this is great. So, Dana, before we leave, what would be 
let's say the new watch collector comes up to you, they're about to jump in there. What are some tips or strategies or just some notes that you give somebody who's about to jump into the space and maybe they're thinking about getting their first watch or they have a watch or two and they're, they're you know, thinking to collect a little bit more, some tips you would give out to the people? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, and I'm sure this has been said a number of times, but I can't hammer it enough, is just buy what you like. Um, I think, you know, and, and I think back on my collecting journey, right, like, it's, it's very easy to kind of get sucked in different directions of like, oh, you should have this because you need to tick off a box for like your like sports watch and then you also need a dress watch and it's like, okay, well, like if I don't wear sports watches, why would I? you know, why would I go for that or, or vice versa, right? And so, I mean, you can kind of see on this table, like I have everything, like it runs like a very wide gamut, but buying what you like, I think minimizes any chances that like later on you're like, I'm like, this isn't me. I'm like not super happy with it. And then you kind of just turn right around and sell it. And, you know, sometimes when you don't get to see a watch in person and you're kind of doing your best based on like pictures and stuff, like it's okay, yeah, like, you know, happens. stuff happens. Exactly. But um, I think, you know, being able to kind of stick true to what you want and developing your taste based off of that is going to be what makes this the most enjoyable. Yes. Right? And to that effect as well, like, you know, if you have your sight set on a specific piece and you know you want that, you know, stick to that, right? Like, even if it is a higher value piece, right? Like, this was my first kind of, like, big purchase. And, you know, I was I, I was looking at some other watches before I landed on this that, you know, they were a little bit more accessible at the time. But I was like, you know what? No, I really wanted a root beer. And I knew that. And I knew it would take me the extra year or two to, to get that. But now looking back, I think whatever watch I would have gotten at that I'm, I'm speculating, but really, you know, I, I'm, I might not have been as happy as I would have been knowing that, like, I knew I wanted this root exactly. beer. So I think kind of like those two go a little bit hand in hand is like buy what you like, but also be patient. Again, we we're talking about things being very temporary and yes. everyone wants like things fast now. Right. But again, with watches, there's something very beautiful about like it kind of almost teaches you patience, right? Like you're very waiting so. and, you know, there's and, and and especially now kind of like with how crazy a lot of some of the pieces yeah. get. Like it's, you'll really find some treasures if you're patient, you go on that hunt, you do the research and find people that you trust to help guide you. I think that's also a big thing because yes. it's, it's overwhelming when you first start and so you're much. trying to learn everything. So I think for me, those are kind of like the two things that have stayed true and, and have, have been really kind of integral to my entire collecting journey. And also to that effect, it's okay to have your taste change. It doesn't need to be the same. I mean, we're people, I, and I, right. think, I think sometimes people forget that, like taste change. You know, you change as a human, and you know, maybe you don't do certain things that you, maybe you don't, maybe you golf and you didn't used to golf. Maybe, you know, COVID happened and you work remote, you don't work remote. Maybe you work half remote, you don't work half dressed up like this. So it's okay to take for taste to change and it's okay maybe you love a diver and maybe you don't love the diver anymore. I think sometimes people get a little stuck, but if they take your seats of advice, buy what you like, I would say buy what you love mm -hmm. um, and be patient. And I think the patient thing is, is, is a real good seed because sometimes you're patient and then you get a really funky piece like that that there or something else really cool will pop up or maybe you might save a little bit of money because the market might correct and you're able to capitalize right. on something there or maybe something new might be released that you didn't even know that you wanted and all of a sudden the love of your life watch-wise just popped up in front of you. Yeah, and also I think this is a question I typically ask myself before I make a watch purchase, and it's been very helpful in, <laughs> you know, controlling what would have been like a more crazy spend. But really, truly, it goes to buying what you love, where like if I see a watch and like, you know, I, I'm thinking about buying it, I always ask myself, am I buying this because I want the feeling of a new watch right now? Mm. Or am I buying this because I truly like it? Like it's it's something that would fit in my collection. I would wear it a lot. Or am I just kind of scratching a niche because I haven't gotten a watch in a while? Oh, that's that's a that's a tough one. Yeah. So that is a question <laughs> that I usually ask I've myself. Done that <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and, you know, a lot of times, like, you start out when you ask yourself a question, it's like, of course I like this watch. But when you really think about it and you start questioning yourself, like, what do I like about it? Like, are you going to wear it in XYZ scenario? And I'm kind of like, I don't know. I don't think it might 
it might not work for me like that, then I'm realizing, okay, like it's as much as I don't want to admit it, it's scratching an itch for like wanting something new, right? But it's not something that for me personally that I think makes sense for me at the time. And who knows, maybe a year from now, two years from now, a beautiful watch that I really will exactly. love will pop up. And that way I don't feel like, oh man, well like, you know, I bought this one and now I have to, you know, like now my dream watch came up. So like, what do I do? So that's kind of one thing that has helped me with like figuring out what I actually love versus kind of like, oh, this is like a, this is nice, but would I actually own it? Yeah, I, I like that. Nothing wrong with a little bit of, um, I guess, self-reflection. I'm just asking, are you going to use it? Are you going to enjoy it? Why are you going to? Why are you buying this? Because you're right. Sometimes you just want to pull a trigger on a new piece. Sometimes, uh, you know, I think right now, especially, you get offered things, and you just want to say yes because you're afraid right. you don't get offered that again. And I think that's a little bit of an issue that's happening where you're afraid to say no because you get offered something. And I think that's something a lot of people. You know, don't be afraid to say no. Just tell, you know, whoever, hey, not for me. I really appreciate that you're thinking of me, but not for me. I would love XXX, but just not this one. Yeah. But I don't want to be, um, you know, that person who take one off the market because it'll end up here. It'll end up with me, you know, as, as a secondary dealer, which yeah. it should end up in a good home, you know, if, if that makes sense. Right, and I think if you are going to someone who you have a good relationship with and someone who understands that, if anything, that's going to be better, right? Because they probably also have other clients who want this watch. And exactly. by you being very honest, by saying this isn't going to work for me, that's okay, right? It's, yeah, and so again, it becomes it's, a win-win. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, you... you, you Patience, once again, yes. like, you know, you're patient, you'll wait for the one that's right for you. And at the same time, you know, the person that works with you is going to understand that and they'll appreciate that you, you know, made that available for another client who that watch was something that they really, really wanted. Exactly, exactly. Oh, so I hope everybody will take these these tips. Uh, very good. Dana, this was awesome. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Uh, we have some really cool things in the pipe that I think that people enjoy. And thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you soon.